Good morning, everyone. Good to be back here with you this morning. If you'd like to have your Bibles open to James chapter 5, God willing, I'd like to finish James chapter 5 today. The book of James, if that's possible. Thank you, Daryl and Joel, for filling in last week. And uh, Joel has put in a lot of extra work for the church over the last few weeks, especially. And I'm very grateful for that. We're going to start with a reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 to 18. And I've asked Anthony to come and read for me. Okay, Anthony. If you guys have your Bibles open, please, to 2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 to 18. Read along. <clears throat> we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so spoke. We also believe and so we also speak. Knowing that he has raised the Lord Jesus, will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for, it is all for your sake so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving uh, to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For the light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, to the things that are unseen for the things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal thank you so much it's a special passage of scripture that helps us to understand as we look into james today because james chapter 5 verse 13 says is anyone among you suffering let him pray is anyone cheerful let him sing praises one of the translations that I have starts this passage out with, Are you in trouble? Well, the fact of the matter is all of us deal with or have trouble in one way or another. And this passage rings true in our hearts even now. From the war in the Middle East to the trouble within our communities and to even the trouble that is within our own heart and mind this morning. James' final words to his readers start with this crazy question. Are you in trouble? Is there any one of you in trouble? Your trouble might be the one that you know that you can work out and sort it out in time. For others, the impact of our trouble is much more intense. It can be financially or emotionally or relationally. And you're not sure, again, how it will all turn out. Even though you've been down this path before, you think, goodness gracious me, how can I possibly do this again? And yet we know that the scripture starts when James starts. He starts with the, the fact that our faith is being tested. It's being tried by the troubles that we're going through. Our, our faith is never tested by the good times. We enjoy the good times. We rejoice in the good times. And God brings us those good times. But the fact of the matter is our faith is always tested by the difficult times that we go through. We're not sure. We don't know when stress or the next bit of bad news come. We're not sure if we'll have what it takes to rise up again or to make any sense of all of it. But we know that God will carry us through. I got a message from a former student last night. I haven't heard from this young man in, I think, 10 or 11 years. 
It's been quite some time. And he, he wrote me and told me that he had just gotten married and that on his honeymoon, he and his wife had a car accident. She broke her back and her legs on their honeymoon. That's a tough way to start a marriage, isn't it? Very, very tough. They're in the mid-twenties. Tough, tough things to happen. But he did say this in his message. He said, we're both holding on to Jesus. And I thought, thank the Lord for that. And we can just hold on to the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we in trouble? James will take us through this once again. And even though his answer to our trouble is an answer that seems trite, especially to believers, it might seem routine and mundane. The true answer is anything but that. Because it is both the privilege and the power and the practice of prayer. It is the basic in the life of the believer that we turn to. And it is not trite. It is not mundane. It is not routine. It is what we depend on day by day. The tradition about James, the person, the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ was that in the later years of his life he was known as Old Camel Knees. How would you like that as your Monica, as your nickname, Old Camel Knees? How do people even know what his knees look like? I don't know. But they say that James spent so much time in prayer through the years of his life that he had calluses on his knees and made his knees really big and callousy and ugly looking like a camel's knees. Well, if that's a result of a prayer life, then God bless him. But he has schooled us well on the fact that our trial of our faith will produce steadfastness. And that steadfastness, when it is at its best and most effective in this life, will produce maturity and the completeness of faith that has no other comparison in the physical or the emotional world of the human being. He has reminded us of the danger of our tongues, hasn't he? He has told us that our tongues, when they are let loose, are like a horse without a bridle, without a ship, without a rudder that cannot be steered. They, it is a deadly evil and a poison, he tells us, with our tongue. But in this same book, of James, he also gives us the best use of our tongue that is possible. The greatest use of our tongue known to mankind and throughout history is the power of prayer and is revealed in the prayer of faith. Turning to God in prayer in all circumstances gives meaning and unity and empowerment to the Christian life. Prayer is the beating heart of the Christian faith. Praying to God is the best and holiest use of our words. Praying lays hold on the heart of God and claims the victory that we have in Jesus Christ. Prayer may well seem to be our last resort, but let it always be said that we should never move forward with anything in life unless we move forward, first of all, on our knees. Prayer is the privilege of our relationship to the living God. It is our faith in action. It is a sign that our faith is not dead. It might be the simple prayer when you say, Lord, please help me. It might be the prayer where you think, no, I need to spend significant time in prayer about a particular decision or an issue or a person that you're praying for. And you go and, and block out a time in your day, in your calendar where you're praying for people. But prayer is an example, it is a sign that our faith is alive and is not dead. We have the example of the praying life of Jesus. Without a question, one of the most significant and impactful passages of scripture for me when I think about Jesus not only praying in the garden but praying that great high priestly prayer in John chapter 17 and I have declared unto him 
the Lord Jesus says, I have declared unto them my name, and we declare that the love wherewith you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. And so we see this relationship that the Lord Jesus had with God the Father, and the relationship that he has prepared for us as well, through the love that he has given us. We have the instructions from the Word of God in the letters of Paul many times about prayer. But probably one of the most classic verses on prayer is found in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And here, James is incorporating both the life of Jesus Christ, as well as the words, the well-known words of the apostles, to remind us again that we are to pray in every circumstance of life. His words are both to us individually, as well as to us as a community of believers today, that yes, we gather together for songs and worship, and yes, we gather together for fellowship, and yes, we gather together to hear the Word of God, and those are the staples of why we do what we do. But let us never come to the point where we diminish the power of prayer in our life or in the life of our church. Practice Prayer is the practice of a life of faith. James asked the questions. Be great for you to go back through the book of James and just highlight the rhetorical questions that James asked throughout the book. There's so many different themes or ways that you can study the book of James. But he says, is anyone sick? Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Now he follows that with the opposite. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing. And that's what we do, isn't it? When we come together, do you feel better when you sing together? Or do you feel a little bit more uplifted when you've got that song in your heart that you pray to, you sing together with someone or you sing on your own? But when he asks the question, is anyone sick? The question is not just about a physical malady, a weakness of the body. But the passage seems to denote a weakness or an incapacity to fulfill daily duties. It can be to an illness. It can be to emotional, mental, spiritual fatigue. It can be because we're worn down by the worries of life. It can also mean that a person is weak because of unconfessed sin. And it shows that the responsibility of the person is to call for the elders of the church. That they may pray over the sick one and anoint them with oil that he or she might be healed. It goes without saying that there are times in our lives when even the simplest act of praying to God seems without our ability. And each of us have gone through that weakness at some point in our existence where we think, I myself cannot pray for myself, I need someone else to pray with me, to carry this burden with me. And we call on people that we recognize as spiritual leaders or people who are uh, walking with the Lord and we say, please, please pray with me about a situation. I need your help. And that is not a sign of weakness. That is a sign of realizing that God is powerful and that prayer is powerful in every situation. Many would hold that in this passage of Scripture that the oil is a symbol, a beautiful symbol of the Spirit of God who lives in and watches over the saint. In James chapter 4 and verse 5 speaks of that. The prayer of the faith of the elder in this passage of Scripture is clearly a prayer that is prayed, that is both led by God and the elder has prayed in obedience to God and the leading of God in that person will be healed. This prayer that is prayed in faith or offered in faith flows from a commitment to God and to His will and must be grounded in biblical truths of faith. 
within that scenario where a person has called for the elder spray and they have done that there's also the possibility that the person has become aware of a sin and I think it's quite ordinary for us when we go through difficult times that we call out to God and we want to make sure that our relationship with God is such to the point that there is no sin that would hinder us at all and we confess to God the scripture is clear that confession is good for us it doesn't have to be an element of this but sometimes it is a part of the reason that a person is facing a trouble and a confession is the best way to unburden the soul so that he or she has faith renewed and their relationship is restored and their confidence in God and his forgiveness and his res restoration is there please note that there's a difference between the person who calls on prayer and then the prayer of fervent prayer of a righteous person prayer is powerful when we call on the unlimited goodness and power and might of the almighty God the scripture says is anyone among you suffering let him pray is anyone cheerful let him sing praises is anyone among you sick let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over them and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up if he has committed sins he will be forgiven therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed and notice this change here the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much one writer says that prayer itself is not pow powerful but prayer that is dependent on the nature and promises of God is a prayer that is always powerful the sense of this passage is that a man who is upright a person who is walking humbly and dependent on God and controlled by the Spirit of God and one who is exercised in the petitioning of God will experience the effectiveness of his prayer life the Word of God is full of the prayers of faith do you remember that Joshua prayed and the Sun stood still do you remember that Elisha prayed and the Shunammite woman's son was restored to life do you remember that Hezekiah prayed and 185,000 Assyrians fell in one day do you remember in the New Testament the prayers of the important uh, neighbor the persistent widow and the Syrophoenician woman and James reminds us of the legend of Elijah it is said among Jewish folklore that there was no greater prophet than the prophet Elijah but James is bringing Elijah even back to human level and he says James was just like you and me but he prayed he prayed that it would not rain and it did not rain what is he saying about Elijah that he believed God that he trusted God that he was a man who did just didn't stand around and wring his hands and worry and fret but he was a man who prayed and he prayed boldly before God because there was a huge problem in Israel at that time the king and the queen who were the king and queen during the time of Elijah Ahab and Jezebel oh my goodness can you imagine what that was like to be a prophet and have those as the king and queen of your country but he prayed he gave himself to prayer and he knew that the only way that the only answer to the corruption of the king and the queen would be brought to justice was by the power of God so he prayed prayer is also the patient partner of restoration James chapter 5 and verses 19 and 20 my brothers if any among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back 
Let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. This seems like an abrupt conclusion to the book of James. It seems like that James should have gone on with a few more verses about why it's important to pray bold prayers like Elijah did. But he stops and he says, just remember that our job is to bring about restoration to those around us, to pray for others. This is the conclusion. These are the final words of the most practical book of living faith, that our faith is tried, that we become more steadfast, our faith becomes more effective and productive. Not so that we can just be little icons of faith, but so that we can be supportive pillars of faith to those around us. Especially when we see another brother or sister who is struggling in their faith, we can pray with them and support them and pray for them and speak so that they can be restored to their walking by faith. Are you troubled in your life? Call for those to pray with you. Are you bewildered and in despair? Call for God to help you. Is your faith a living faith based on the way that you pray? When I was growing up, there was a little chorus that we often sang. It went something like this. Just keep on praying till light breaks through. The Lord will answer, he'll answer you. God keeps his promise, his word is true. Just keep on praying till the light breaks through. Just keep on praying till light breaks through. God is here. God is hearing us. God will answer our prayer. He will bring us comfort. He will bring us peace. He will give us a sense always that He is in control. We bow our heads in prayer, please, before we move to our communion. Lord, we believe and know the power of prayer in our own life as well as in the life of our church, our corporate prayers. Dear Lord, we, we pray together. We see answers to prayer. Sometimes the answer comes by that burden that is lifted. And sometimes the answer comes with persistent praying and patient praying and and, and knowing, dear Lord, that in your time you will work all things for your good. And many times, dear Lord, even before the answer comes, we can see that you're already at work. We can see that you're performing your work among us, Father God. We know that when we pray, our faith is strengthened because we are called upon to to call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whether we are sick and suffering, or even whether we are cheerful and singing, dear Lord, we can pray. We can call for others to pray with us, dear God. We can be the kind of people by the exercise of our prayer of faith that we can be effective, fervent prayer warriors. Dear God, I pray that as we have looked through this book of James, we've been encouraged and challenged in our walk with you, dear Lord, that our faith will be strengthened, that all that we have gone through and all that we will go through will help us to keep our eyes turned upon you, dear Lord, that we will trust you and we will pray fervently for your will to be done in our midst. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm just going to ask for a short time of quiet meditation for Lennon.
Robert to play. Uh, I would like for you as as much as possible just to pray about the thoughts of the message and the importance of our communion time this morning. <clears throat> 